the, uh, this new arrangement probably is no guarantee for success. That's in part because they come into it with a catastrophe nearly on their hands. But I think you have to ask a different question. Which is more likely to succeed, the old system or this new uh, venture, that is, this new commonwealth? And I think that of all the prospects, the new commonwealth is probably going to be the most likely. The army was involved anyway, and it's Gorbachev who indeed is bringing the army in. Gorbachev has been discredited. Some way or another, they've got to get rid of Gorbachev. Uh, look, this, um, not that I want to get into an lecture on history, especially here, but if you were to take a map of the old Russian Empire and the Soviet Union as we knew it and superimpose one on the other, they would nearly coincide. We're talking about something that was an empire that had a facelift in Soviet times. And we also know that all empires at some time or the other must fall apart, sometimes with great civil wars and bloodshed, and sometimes not. This is a major empire that is coming apart, I think, relatively peacefully. Relatively peacefully, and I happen and, to and, believe... And if it hadn't been done this way, I worried that it was going to be a, a violent one, because... Yugos even look at Yugoslavia, where just one tiny part of it wants to become independent, and someone else doesn't, and well, this is what you, you, you get. You just gave the lecture on history that you weren't going to give. <laughs> I would dispute... What's the lecture? I, well, very sketchy your kind recitation of... of history. I would dispute your recitation of history, but let's accept it for what it is. No, but wait we a need to, wait, 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 wait. What there, empire has not fallen apart? Well, I, this was not a traditional empire. It was not an overseas empire. Oh, it but was, it was well, certainly... Marshall, it was now, coercive. I sat, no. I sat very peacefully why you gave your theory of political development, and I, I resented it, but I listened to it respectfully. Let right, me get Steve, a few words Steve, out. Steve, you always do this, you know. Right, let let you, me get a few words you, out. Your problem is never getting a few words out. Your problem is letting others give their presentation, oh. but go well, ahead. Well, let us hear. All right. Right. We we will, will, it yeah. seems to me we have to ask a fundamental question. Would it be best for all 15 of the former republics now to become independent states? Now, what does it mean to be an independent state? It means to have your own economy, your own currency, your own military. Or would it be better, leaving the Baltics aside because they're gone and they're an exceptional case, for the others to form some kind of union, commonwealth, or federation? That is the foremost question. If you think it would be better to have some general overarching union, then the next question is, is the way Yeltsin and Kravchuk went about it, is that the best, most durable, consensus-building, right. safe way to do it? And I, think, they're, yeah, they're, please, please. And I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is to yes. To both questions? Uh, yes, I th I, both questions. Okay. I think there has to be some kind of relationship, it's because well, indeed they are, they have become more independent. More than a relationship. We're okay, but they're union. In, independent. In fact, I think the answer may be not necessarily, but it's like saying, it's like the commercials on television here about, I don't want to grow up. It's not a question of whether it's good or it's not. It's a well, question of it's let's, inevitable. Let's, let's, How can you, if a people desire to be independent, and are hell bent on that. Why How do you, you think? I heard in your prologue you said that all of these people in the former Soviet Union desire to be independent. Yes. There is no evidence for oh, that. Oh yes. Oh yes. Well, yes. wait a minute. Well, there was a referendum well, in Steve, March. Excuse me. There was a yes, referendum Steve, in March well, yes, 1991. Yes. Yes. Ninety-six percent voted for the union. Secondly, have you read the independence resolutions? Have you I actually had, read yes. them? No, no, no. No, no constitutional no, lawyer in the world would call that any other than a cooked piece of legislation. It said, in light of the coup that happened in Moscow, yes. should, do you approve of the resolution adopted by the Ukrainian parliament for independence? In other words, if you were against that resolution, you were for the coup. You See, are saying, nobody would allow that thing You are saying the then books. that a referendum in the Ukraine uh, worded differently, simply, would you want the Ukraine to be independent, would not get an overwhelming That would not be the way you would, you would have to do it like this. You would have to say, do you wish to see the Ukraine become independent. independent. That is, to have no state relations, be not part of a larger state, and have its own army, own currency, yeah. and make its own way in the world. Overwhelming. You would not have gotten 90%. You else. would have gotten 85 I doubt it. Oh, Steve, I doubt can I, can it. I, I say, you were referring, you were right referring to, to all the republics. You, such a vote has never appeared in the Central Asia. There are five of That's them. True. Not in Armenia, Azerbaijan. Steve, is it possible to, to, to say something now? Is it I all mean, right? You're, I, can't, you're, I can't tell you what's possible, Mark. Well, okay. Please, go right <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I, we, we, he and I have had this before, and it usually it's very difficult. Uh, the problem is that Steve assumes, first of all, that the Union, as we knew it, the Soyuz, as we knew it, was a legitimate organization. It wasn't legitimate. There was never an election. 
Uh, the wording indeed is confusing, that, that, but that's not the issue. Where was the, the election issue, on this union? The, 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 the election in this union did take place Where? in the Ukraine. It took place in also some of the other there republics, which have declared... There was nothing about Steve, a common no, wealth and what that election. Wait a minute, Steve. When you interrupt me, it's not right. It's a misstatement. Because, if I interrupt no you, of election, course... There was no reference I to I think you should have some <laughs> <laughs> respect Please let it make for, our, for our <laughs> listeners go, go ahead. who would like to understand what you're saying. Not to mention the translator. That's right. Well, now, think of what happened just 10 days ago. 10 days ago. Ago, there were reports that uh, Yeltsin was considering a nu preemptive nuclear strike against uh, the Ukraine. It was denied, but that appeared in Moscow News and uh, Independent Gazette. There were also increasing tensions building up between the Ukrainians and the Russians over trade issues, over economic issues, over border issues. Uh, the the uh, Donetsk ba the the Basin, the Crimea, there were demonstrations, yes. people were protesting. Now, it was beginning to escalate. Salai was said, we're going to squeeze, we're going to starve the Ukraine. Now, when you begin talking things like that, and I've heard Kravchuk, the president of the Ukraine, speak, say, we're not going to yield one inch of territory. When you get rhetoric like that, you're verging on some very difficult times, and that, therefore, I think your point is well taken, that, that we were verging on some violence. There is violence now in other parts of, of, of that and country. And has been for the, a while. The, the, today, the, John and Armenia is a typical... Over a thousand lives have been lost there. Today, Moldavia is in chaos. Georgia is in chaos. I mean, the, the question is, what has to hold together? And, and I think Steve's problem is that he has such an infatuation, as George Bush has had with, with Gorbachev, that it is very difficult to see this man who deserves a role in history be cast aside. But, but let's not blind ourselves with one particular man in this case. I think the important issue is what is most likely to survive, and under these circumstances, the, the Confederation, this, not the Confederation, the Commonwealth, is more likely to survive than what we had before. It's going to do all the things that Gorbachev wanted, but it's going to be headquartered it's in Minsk, which looking will be... that way. It's it, looking it, that way at this uh, point. May I have your uh, indulgence <laughs> for one break here? We will be back with Professors Cohen and Goldman in just a moment. And we are back, and I'm going to do something we usually don't do, which is tell you what we were discussing during the break. We had a little bit of an argument going on here about the, uh, the threat of a nuclear attack, uh, supposedly from Russia, from Yeltsin, addressed to the Ukraine, which was indeed published in the Moscow News, but which is a rumor, which is a rumor and it's not been confirmed, well, no, and this is something we should know. What was published was that supposedly Boris Yeltsin said that Russia would use a nuclear weapon as a preemptive weapon against the Ukraine. He raised correct? the The report was that he raised the right. possibility with his military staff, right. the Russian military. And that was subsequently it was denied. But the point is, it appeared in two Moscow newspapers. Well, it's that's a fact. It's a fact, but it's also a fact that it was denied. It, absolutely a fact. Clearly, it, absolutely no. it was denied, it, and it, and that's there's no doubt about that. But the point is that the fact that it was published did create anxiety in the oh, Ukraine. Oh, no doubt about it. And the fact that it was published here, I believe, in the New York Times, and, the Boston and Globe given and the more Financial prominence Times. than the denial, also creates a lot of anxiety. Sure. I'd like to get to this issue of the Union. You know, I think, look at what's happening in Europe. It's healthier when countries get together. There's no doubt about it. I would like to see a Union in my country. But I think that when a Union has been forced for a long time, psychologically, it's necessary to part before you can come together again. And my feeling is that this Commonwealth is now a voluntary, at least up to a point much more voluntary, coming together than what we had before. Now, do you agree with that? No. You don't. Why not? OK, tell well, me. Well, let me more. ask you a question. Let's. Well, let's, you're not let's, answering mine. Well, That's what they I, do in Odessa. You say you see a lot of voluntarism, <laughs> voluntarism. Yes, here. I do. People agreeing, consensus. Yeah. Where do you see it? The three guys went to Minsk or to Brest. Well, the parliaments yeah. have now endorsed it, both yeah. Russian, Ukrainian, right. and Belarusian. What about Belarus? the rest of the Moldavia wants to join, it seems very obviously. Nazarbayev seems now to want to join, too. I said more voluntary than what happened back in well, 1922. I hope you're right. I mean, I really do hope you're right. I hope that this Commonwealth gets consensus, that people begin to see it as the right way, that cooperation grows, that they create a unified military command, that they disarm the nuclear weapons. But I don't think it's, there's a chance of this happening, because I think the procedure was wrong. 
Uh, Yeltsin said yesterday something very interesting. Uh, in answering people who said, but you didn't do this procedurally, constitutionally, and through consensus, you imposed something on the other uh, nine republics. No, they could have said no. Well, wait a minute. He's, no, they couldn't. How, was could, it, well, how could he be imposed? No, no, go ahead. Let me finish. All right. So, see, so the, the reality of the situation is He said is what? This? Look, right, he said, yes, we did do that. Yes. But we had no choice. Okay. We could, this was the only way we could do right. it. That's honor. That's honest. Right. Don't call it democracy. No. Don't no. call it voluntary adhesion to a new voluntary union. Because the bottom line was this. The Central Asian republics had no choice. They are utterly lock, stock, and yo-yo, dependent on the three Slav nations economically. They, to say to them, as Yeltsin said after they cut this deal, these three guys cut this deal in Belarus, you're independent states. Do what you wish. was a fraudulent statement. He knew it. It was a political game. It was conceived weeks ago. Yeltsin's own aide said yesterday that we did this to eliminate Gorbachev. Now we'll build our union. Let me point out one other thing, Volodya, Steve, because you know this. Being very selective my, my, last this. Po my last well, we'll point. Well, just, just finish there, this. And... The, I care a lot about democracy, and it wounds me to see democracy being... What, what democracy did exist in Russia dismantled. But leave that aside. There's something else happening. Yeltsin says that he's dismantling the center. As a Russian, you and I both know that Russia was the center. Call it a union, it was Russia. The old ministries, the nucleus of them, are being preserved, but they're no longer being paid out of a union budget, they're paid out of a Russian budget, and they're no longer being called union ministries, they're being called Russian ministries. That is, as this process is going on, the center is being rebuilt under the control of Yeltsin in Moscow, and moreover, it's being built, rebuilt in a way that is diminishing the role of representative government inside Russia itself. The only hope of any democratic outcome in Russia, given her 500 years of autocratic tradition, is representative government. Right. And that is being dismantled by the weak. And you know that. You know what's I'll going on. I'll come back to that, please. Well, Professor. Steve, I think you're, you're misrepresenting everything. First of you say that it was coercive. First of everything, all... Everything, every word I said was, was incorrect? You said that you said... Not every word, but, but enough. But enough right. was to get to mislead. Uh, to Your viewpoint is but my viewpoint is that the three republics got together first of all voluntarily. Nobody forced, and Yeltsin didn't force them into this. He was concerned about this because otherwise the Ukraine would have gone, would have been lost. Now the, then, then you bring together the uh, uh, Central Asian republics. Nobody forced them to do it. They could have done it. They Kazakhstan uh, has enough uh, energy, has enough uh, grain. And Uzbekistan uh, also has uh, natural gas reserves and, and cotton, and they could, they could have done it economically. They didn't want to do it economically, but to say they were co coerced into doing it is a misrepresentation. To say that democracy is dis being dismantled uh, is also a misstatement. What made you think that the democracy that existed there is going to be any different from what we see here? And you say that Yeltsin is, is imposing himself on all of these different uh, institutions. It's the Russians that are now taking over. If you read what the Ukraine has been saying, indeed the problem is that the Ukraine is going to be separate enough. They're taking over control of the Baltic Sea Fleet. They're taking control of their own army. They've announced the Black that today. Sea Fleet. I'm sorry, the Black Sea right. Fleet. The Black right. Sea Fleet. They're taking over more and more control of their own economy. If anything, the, the danger is that this new organization will fragment in, in, in such a way that it, that it won't be uh, viable enough. But yes. they're each all is issuing their own currencies. You, you have to understand... If you believe, if you, if you now, really Steve, believe... No, no, I let you finish. You no, really Steve, believe... No, I let you finish, <laughs> and you and see, it's, one, it's a one-sided kind of thing. Go ahead. Uh, the, the, point, the point is that in this particular situation, uh, they're issuing their own currencies. They're going to have control of their own economy because the, the economy had been lost. You know, there is such a thing that you say, you keep saying democracy. Gorbachev has never run for a popular election. These that other three correct. leaders, these other that three leaders correct. have. That doesn't mean that it guarantees you democracy, as we see in Georgia, where they also had a, <coughs> had a representative election. But the point is that, indeed, just because you see this kind of thing doesn't mean that, that it's, it's being democratic. And when you say it's dismantling, I think you're distorting it. You don't want to see it collapse, but you have to recognize that it's being done. You can't say it's undemocratic because there is no constitutional uh, provision for this thing, which was created in a coerced way in the first place. I do not think, I do not think, and I'm stunned to listen to you, utterly stunned. Well, you shouldn't be. As a fellow American, that listening to what you just said, you have the slightest concept of what democracy means. Yeltsin himself well, I you're said going to yesterday, inform well, me. well, now, wait a minute, you just got through telling me that sure. I shouldn't interrupt you. Well, okay. Because You've made yeah, me please. practically jump out of my seat, because every time I begin to speak, I can feel you sort of leaning toward me, about to speak. Yeltsin himself <laughs> yesterday said it wasn't democracy. But he it himself never was. admitted it. It never was. No, it being this process. Of course. Right. I don't know if... Professor Shulman knows, uh, Goldman, excuse me, knows what's going on inside Russia. But there's a deep split. As I'm you sure know, we'll hear. Of course. Of course there is. 
There is. Steve. I mean, when you're, you're going right. to insult me, when you're going to insult me to say those things, you know, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're going to give me a lecture, do and I have a right to defend you, myself. You yourself know what's going on inside the democratic movement in Moscow. They're yes. deeply split, split Very over much what so. Yeltsin's being done. Very much so. The core of the issue inside Russia, we leave the question of the union, go back to Russia, because I do believe, it's my own view, and it's just a, a speculation, but I think it's an informed one, that five years from now or ten years from now, as you all have your long-running hit show, building viewers. Are you not trying years. to insult us too? No, come on. I'm sure you'll be here. I'm sure you'll be here in five or ten years. Right, so. That you'll come back and you will see something like a union, an empire, a commonwealth in that territory and Russia will be the dominant power. I believe that. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I believe that's what's going to happen. But how, how can it be otherwise when it's such a large country? Well, good. We agree. Therefore, that's not, therefore that's not it is vital. Yeah, go ahead. It's vitally important what happens inside Russia herself. Vitally important absolutely, for the others. Absolutely agree. The issue inside Russia has been, since Yeltsin took charge after the coup, whether the policies he's pursued have been toward building democracy or not. It's split the democratic movement. And he's done two things that have greatly alarmed your friends and my friends. I don't know your own view on it. One, he's devised a system to impose his own personal representatives over local officials in the, I don't remember how many there are, 58 or 70 provinces Unless. of Russia called Oblast. Yeah. That's the first thing. Right. And secondly, as Russia begins to fall apart herself, because she is a union, as you know, of non-Russian minorities, as they begin to break away, his first temptation was to use force. Yes, parliament it was. stopped yes, him. Yes, it was. And therefore, people are looking at Yeltsin and they're saying this. But Parliament he, stopped him. That's, that's right. Parliament stopped him. It was an important moment. Right. I agree. Yeah. Therefore, the question now emerges inside Russia, is what Yeltsin's doing democratic or is it only necessary? We, above all, must make that as distinction. I might agree with you, Volodya, and with you, that it's necessary, but I will not call it democracy. Oh, but what, nobody what, has. Let me ask so, you, let me tell you something, and you might want so, to hear this, too. I interviewed Yeltsin about a year and a half ago, and I asked him, I said, are you a Democrat? Mm. And you know what he said? Mm -mm. He said, no. He said, you know where I come from. You know my history. You know how I rose up through the ranks. I would hope to become more democratic, he said. Maybe the people around me will help me become more democratic, but I'm not a Democrat. I mean, Steve says this is people, not democratic. The people around him or the Steve, people Steve like thinks him this is a perfect place? world. Well, not and that, that, you know, what he, what he forgets as a historian is that there has never been mm -hmm. any long-lasting democracy in that part of the world. Not one of the republics has, has something that we would call democracy. No, what no. we began to see was freedom of the press, more openness. Uh, Yeltsin closed down some papers. I'm not saying it's a perfect kind of situation. But, but to argue about these kinds of things seems to be to me to miss the crux of the issue. The crux of the issue is, are they going to survive? Are they going to move ahead? And is it going to be no, a we'll more perfect system? Let's talk about it. And that. we'll be back in just a moment. Hi, caller. I'm glad you waited. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, my question centers around the perspective of the uh, third world countries that have largely depended on the Soviet Union for economic and military support, whether the demise of the Soviet Union as we know it spells impending disaster in the form of a renewed uh, imperialism and a renewed sense of colonialism that's going to be able to go unchecked against this, the, the African and Asian countries that make up the so-called third world. Uh -huh. Very, very good question. Hi, are you there? We're not going to ignore it. Go ahead, caller. Yes, um, I have a quick question. On the news, we see a lot about Moscow, St. Pete, Minsk, uh, and Kiev. My question is, what, what is the mood of people who have been loyal communists in uh, areas like uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenia? There's places that we never hear about in television. Thank you. Hi, are you there? Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I would like to ask a question which I haven't, been, I haven't seen raised in the broadcast or print media is what is going to happen ultimately to the seat of the Soviet Union on the United Nations Security Council. Very and good. Are you there? Hi. You had a brief question. Yes. It's just with you, gentlemen. Uh, what I think that's going to happen in the Soviet Union, and, then, and I'd like to have a response on this, I think the people themselves will force a centralized government to come about, just as they have in Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. I think that the starvation and the economic uh, call 
for for goods and food themselves will force this to come about. Is that what you gentlemen believe, whether there be next year or in five years? And it won't matter who the Gorbachevs and the Yeltsins and the Kravchuks are, that just sheer economics, as they have in Eastern Germany, uh, what was Eastern Germany, will continue this uh, uh, momentum. Very good. Uh, well, should we be <laughs> proud of our callers? Uh, let's, uh, you win. That's an easy one, isn't it? Very what easy. Uh, UN? <laughs> well, presumably it'll be the Russian Republic uh, that will take over. And then others will appeal and uh, well, perhaps... No, well, we'll no, this, no, this is the Security Council. Only the oh, secu so it is. Security all Council right. seat. No, I mean, right. after all, uh, Belarusia and the Ukraine already have seats. They on are Russia, members, Russia right. does not have a seat and presumably will inherit that Would seat. you think that will happen? Well, the Security Council would have the option of giving it to none of them. Well, what do you think it would do? I think I'll give it to Russia. Okay, so we're they agreeing can't, they there. Can't ignore All right. They can't. Proud uh, communists, what's going to happen to these? Uh... Well, they, some of them are still continuing to be communists, and that's causing them difficulty because that's the only thing they knew. But this opens the way then for uh, people in uh, the fundamentalists to come in from Iran, and they're coming in and making a lot of this trouble is, in uh, other alternative in Central Asia. The gentleman made a very nice reference to St. Pete's. I like yeah, that yeah. a whole lot. Uh, but I thought he meant Florida much. Right. Well, I, but the, I don't know how the communists are doing in Florida, but that's yeah. another question. But Probably doing better than in it, Moscow. <laughs> This is a serious issue. Uh, yeah, the big cities, the more liberal, perhaps, cities, Moscow, Kiev, Leningrad, Sverdlovsk, so on. But what about Central Asia? First of all, I don't think you can lump it all together. No. Kyrgyzstan is one thing and Uzbekistan yeah. is another. But what, what, what do you think, Steve? What's the well, feeling out you, there? Well, best you can tell, uh, in the Central Asian republics, for the most part, the old Communist Party apparatus, though they've renamed themselves, are still in charge of property and power. Exactly. Nazarbayev, who's an interesting man and the president of Kazakhstan, and until this deal was cut in Minsk by Kravchuk and uh, Yeltsin, was really the number three central leader in the Soviet Union. He just ran for president and got 98% of the vote, but there, he had no opponent on the ticket. So what one wants to make of that, he, like, it's interesting that virtually every significant political leader on the scene throughout the country today is an ex-communist. And most of yes. their followers have come out of even Yeltsin, for example, the people around him in the so-called, in his own Oval Office, mainly come out of his old apparatus when he ran it of down. Of course, but, of course. but there was so an election in Tajikistan, and there a communist did win, and he ran against the, the way, nationalist. And the nationalist, however, was being yeah, backed by yeah. the fundamentalists, so that we don't know. Could we, could we bring up number 11 on the, uh, the screens here for us? Uh, I think they're interesting. It tells us what type of society would you like to see in Russia's future? And now look at that. Socialism like that of the past, 10%. A more democratic socialism, I underline the word socialism, 36%. A Swedish-style capitalism, 23%. And let's go to number 12 now. We continue. A free market capitalism like the U.S., only 17%. And no opinion, 14%. Now, this is a Times mirror poll of Moscow and St. Pete's, believe it or not, where it seems that American capitalism does not seem to charm most of those people. Swedish capitalism seems to be a somewhat nicer, but if you were to add the two figures, you get 46% for socialism of some sort and 40% uh, for capitalism of some sort. So even in St. Pete's and Moscow, the people seem to be more supportive of socialism. Let me, let me well, of course, they don't really know what full capitalism is, and in the meantime, they don't the know what Swedish socialism. But, but it's been it's been presented in a much better way. Yes. I mean, and, and you know, you, the reformers, uh, Gorbachev, for a while was talking about this way. Let's look at Sweden. And then, of course, nobody's been talking about much since Sweden most basically voted out the, the socialist party. I mean, there's you know, there's there's kind of a time warp here. We don't, they don't know. Uh, there's still the image of Sweden, not knowing but that the still. Swedes. Oh, sure. These I mean, figures. sure. Well, I mean, you know, don't forget this, you know, people like you were presenting inside the Soviet media the lines of the unemployed, uh, and it was always made to look much no, that worse. That wasn't than me. You, I never yeah. worked abroad, and I never showed a single well, picture. Well, other people did. Yeah. Let's not get into Okay, but the Soviet media was not really always giving. Incidentally, a, there's a lot to show out there right Today, now. it's bad. Right I don't, there. I, I don't, you know, I don't, don't deny that. I don't, right. I don't deny right. it. I mean, it's a race when we talk about a recession in this particular instance. But, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that the vote represents. Uh, necessarily an informed public. I'm simply saying that Kyrgyzia or Uzbekistan much or whatever would off. be probably much stronger. So one Soviet economist uh, said that he personally preferred the uh, Swedish model. That was Mr. Ligachov, right? right? No, no, I no, think no, it was no. Mr. Abalkan, actually. Yeah, it was Abalkan uh -huh. and, and Shatalin. Yeah, so? My turn? <laughs> no. Uh, he said um, he preferred the Swedish model.
but the problem was there weren't enough Swedes in Russia. That was shut down. And think, that's wasn't? very yeah. witty, but it also goes to what many scholars believe the central point. You can't implant systems from other countries into a country that has its own set of traditions. It depends on what you think is going on inside Russia. Today. The former uh, Soviet Union and its third world client states was a very that's a good, that good, was a good It was an intriguing question because one of the things that's happening today, for example, in North Korea, signing this agreement with South Korea, I think is one of the consequences of the fact that the Soviet Union now is, no longer exists. The same kind of thing about the Middle East, the whole negotiations. They cannot look to the Soviet Union as a troublemaker. They cannot look to it as a, as a protector, and therefore they have to come to terms with the outside world. There is a danger here, and I would recognize the danger that the United States, as the only superpower that, that's left, can be... Uh, uh, too strong and, and, and take for granted some of these things and so we really have to watch ourselves but for the time being I think that the third world really has to look only the question, to, the, to the international the community. The question as it was voiced or worded came from someone who believed that the third world has been exploited right. not to use the word raped yep. by the imperialist powers of which the United sure. States is a leading one that, and that the Soviet Union in a way acted exactly. as a deterrent to that and now when the Soviet Union is gone what is going to happen is the U.S. is going to go in there and just do what it well, wants. Well, now, is that danger well, real? I, I recognize that danger. That's why I said we have to watch our own step in this particular case. But at the same time, I think that it's also important to recognize that there's another side to it, that sometimes these third world countries were in, encouraged to engage in mischief, which is no longer uh, good for the world. And I think that's the example of, of the North Korean uh, situation. North Koreans have to face up to the fact that they can't just simply go on the way they've been doing. Hi, caller. Thanks for waiting. Hello. Um, I would like to know exactly what has happened to the uh, words, word, words, tools. Um, you know, have, have all the military, um, the missiles and things, been withdrawn to Russia uh, as each? Place? Right. One more time. The uh, republics with uh, with uh, nuclear well, uh, armament uh, include. Uh, let us do this. Let us look at number ten. Both for the uh, the person who's asked the question. A lot of people want to see this. These are the nuclear warheads. Russia has 17,505. These are the sources, the Arms Control Association and Natural Resources Defense Council. Ukraine has 4,356. Belorussia, now being called Belarus for Belarus. some reason. I don't know why. They but mean, anyway, Belorussia is one, yes it is, 1,222. And finally, Kazakhstan, 1,690. That's the way the warheads are distributed. Now, that does not mean uh, the, uh, the missiles are basically most of them in Russia proper. I have to say that I'm not worried by the nuclear thing at all. I think too much has been made of it. I think four fingers on the non-existent trigger, because as we know, there's no button and no trigger, is just well, as good as one. Well, and in well, some I, I would work, I would you have not met William Gates, the head of the CIA, who breathlessly told my Congress well, that's what they this are. week, it's awful. There, people are starving, people are going to get mad, there's chaos, and I mean, the, he was breathing heavy on this very alarming alert, which was his first major salvo following his confirmation as head of the CIA. What are your thoughts here? The danger of tactical nuclear weapons, and the danger is twofold. They can be used tactical because the coding system unlike with strategic nuclear weapons is very simple. Field commanders know how to use tactical nuclear weapons. Right. The second problem is is there are a lot of them mm -hmm. and the third problem is nobody knows where they all are. Uh, it was reported in Moscow, I, one of your colleagues actually, your former colleagues uh, on, a, on a national television show was interviewing Arbatov's son who's an authority on yes, weapons he yes. and he was trying to find out from the defense ministry where the tactical nuclear weapons were and it didn't know completely or wouldn't tell him but for example they think there may be tactical nuclear weapons in Georgia a country that could have its own civil war between the Georgian government and the Ossetians, for example. Therefore, the real danger, I think, is, is that some excitable and excited uh, field commander in a fit of nationalist passion may decide to use or threaten to use or play with a tactical nuclear It's a dangerous situation. I, I and agree. also I, there are nuclear reactors all over the country uh, which are not in great shape. Uh, and oh, that's, that's that for I, sure. I We've had not, Chernobyl. I would agree 100 percent with what Steve said in, in this particular instance. Uh, it's Tsalayev, who was the prime minister for a while of the Russian of Republic, Russia, yeah. um, <clears throat> told one of my friends that he himself did not know, the government did not know the number of weapons that were out there, particularly the tactical weapons and where they were located. Um, it turns out that yesterday's Financial Times uh, had an article 
we're reporting the fact that one of the commodity markets, the <laughs> commodity exchanges which have just been set up now in Moscow, had a, a, a notice that it had a nuclear reactor for sale. Uh, and if they have nuclear reactors for sale, we also have to worry about some of these tactical weapons yeah. being taken out of the country. This is something really to worry about. Translated, Vladimir is wrong. He should be worried. He should no, be worried. I, no, I should what? be worried internally. Internally, See, the, not externally. The point is, Mr. Gates is making Americans think that they're going to be attacked, possibly, by some crazy Russians or Azerbaijanis who are going to have to get their hands on weapons. The point is, it's dangerous for us inside the country because those tactical weapons cannot go far. They're very limited in how far they well, can go. Well, they can go. be smuggled, but I, I don't think but, that's what he's but saying. But it's not more that. dangerous I, I don't than think he's nuclear weapons in Pakistan or anywhere else Absolute, in that sense. Well, it's, except there are lots you of know. And in this particular case, there are also lots of engineers and scientists who are looking for jobs. Did you ever think you'd come to the day where you said you weren't particularly worried about the use of nuclear weapons outside the country? I think what you're saying. No, I'm wait, just wait, wait, explaining wait. because this wait. is being used to scare people here. Well, but Whereas no, but he's not saying we should be concerned about what may happen to them. That well, is not the tone of voice, I'm and sure I want to make right. that distinction. I, I, still, I didn't read a... it that way. You, I, I can see how you can see it that way, but my, I, the way I read it is maybe the way I wanted to think, and that is I'm worried about what's going on inside the Soviet Union, not only in Georgia, but also in the Republic of Azerbaijan, where there were indeed tactical weapons. Yes. And that, since there's an active war going on between Armenia and, and Azerbaijan, I think that's something I, I, that I'm not even so sure in regard to that, that good question by that earlier caller, that the Soviet Union has withdrawn from the, uh, the Third World. We do not know if the Russian government is still selling military equipment to the third world. There would be a temptation to continue to do so because it is a foreign currency earning enterprise. There's no doubt about it. And we can't be completely certain. And I'm thinking, I think it probably will continue I'm to sell. To think it will I'm too. think it will. Yes, yes, yes. Just like Czechoslovakia is doing the same thing. And we haven't really given uh, you an opportunity, either of you, to speak to the issue of the army. Who's got it? How um, you know? How will this fragment? And we'll ask you those and other questions in just a moment. And so the army. Let us take a look at the map of what was the Soviet Union very briefly, if we may. There it is, and now let's see where all the missiles are. There they are. You see, mainly in Russia. All right. Now, let's take a look at, uh, let me see, number 13, if we may. A question was asked in that same poll that we've mentioned today. What authority do you trust most to deal with Russia's problems? Republic's authorities, 45%. Central authorities, 27 Soviet army, 6 these are, these are Russians responding. Russians responding. Russians are only 6% would trust the army to deal with the country's problems. Take it from there, if you will. What were, you seem to be particularly frightened by the politicization or concerned. Wasn't the Red Army always extremely politicized in the sense of the, co the, the political commissar there? It was always a very political army, don't you think? It was, but there was never uh, a concept publicly articulated that the army is a collective entity and its leadership should intervene in political life at the top. They did, of course, they lobbied for money, they, lobbied, they, influenced, yes. they influenced political outcomes. But something interesting happened when democratization began in the Soviet Union in 1988. The political leadership, the Gorbachev leadership, was forced to win the army's agreement to elections to allow army officers on active duty to stand for parliament. And the result was is a lot of army officers were elected or got themselves appointed yeah. there, and yeah. they formed a caucus, as you know, in indeed. the parliament, and they became a potent political force. But they split. They split. They well, split. They did. They split. But, but, the, but, but the hardliners, I think, were dominant. And, 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 and they, formed yeah. co they formed coalitions with civilians. So you fear... Well, then the next thing that happened is as the country began to fall apart, and I believe the crisis of the Union actually goes back to 89. It didn't begin just now. I but agree as with people you. looked around and saw the country falling apart, the press began to speculate which force in the land was capable of holding the country together. And inevitably, they talked about the army because, and now, after the collapse of the Communist Party, the only institution organized on a union-wide basis with a command center, whether it would work or not is another question, there are two forces. One is the army, and the other is the military-industrial complex, which is a kind of extension of the army. So this is a powerful force, and what we saw yesterday and the day before was very interesting. 
We saw Gorbachev and Yeltsin Both going to negotiating with right. But the moment you enter into political negotiations with an army, you have legitimized the idea so you that see... the army can either be a broker of political outcome, but remember that the history of military intervention in politics in the third world has been first the army brokers an right. outcome, then it says, to hell with it, we can do better and right. we take over. Only, let's uh, keep uh, in uh, mind, uh, we'll go right to you, but let's keep in mind that never in the history of Russia has the army had its man on top. Well, not were, in the tradition. There were attempts. There, it's not in the tradition, right. there, but there were attempts. And of course, in August, the army intervened, and then during the Khrushchev era, they came to help go, uh, Khrushchev stay true, in the power. True. But I'd, I'd go back earlier. I'd say that the army's problems really go back to Afghanistan because they were discredited in Afghanistan. Also, in the aftermath of that, people, mothers began to form groups. It was an incredible thing for me to see mothers against uh, the draft yes. because yes. the young men were being drafted in the army. They were being hazed. You had almost 5,000 people, young men a year, being killed be through a fragging of a, a peacetime uh, uh, harassment this way. So that I think that the army indeed uh, had begun to lose this. Do you this fear girl. the army now? Well, I fear the army now, and, and in this sense, I will blame Gorbachev because rather than going, he decided to hold on, and that led uh, the, to this bargaining for support of the army. And it, as a consequence, in, in my mind, it was like the Orthodox par uh, party in Israel. Each side wants their support, and therefore they end up with more than they would otherwise have. If Gorbachev had recognized this, uh, this Commonwealth and said, okay, I'm, I'm out, I'm no longer relevant, then he wouldn't try to appeal to the army. And now the army comes out stronger than it would otherwise have been, and I think that's a mistake. You, you share that view? No, because I guess maybe the basic disagreement between us is that I don't think these issues can be reduced to this leader or that. I think what's going on inside this territory is a ferocious struggle over power and property. In every little town, in every big town, in every institution, who's going to take control of this vast state property? Do you know that Who's that... going to take, care, take control of this vast military capability? Every, the old elite fragmented, and now they're fighting over all this property and power. This leader, but, that leader, may emerge for a moment as the spokesman of one group, but it's these larger forces that are going to turn on the outcome. And in that context, in that context, obviously the army is a contender. That's not a prediction. But, but the army but it is the strongest, and it has an ideology. But the army wouldn't have been so strong if it hadn't been for Gorbachev offering this opportunity to come involved, because the army is indeed being fragmented. It's being fragmented because each republic now is creating its do own army. Do you think it's all over for Gorbachev? I think it's all over you for do, Gorbachev. You do, do you? Are you asking me? Yes. I think Gorbachev's role as the reform leader of the Soviet Union is over. Yes. I think if he has the possibility to do it in a, in a dignified way, he will step down. Whether that means his political career is over or not depends. There are two possibilities. He could, he could go off to the dacha to grandchildren and memoir writing, or the country may fall apart and he may have a second political life, as did de Gaulle. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's rather interesting, in modern times, in my lifetime, Two great leaders were rejected by their own people yes. after doing great things. Yes, Churchill, Churchill, Churchill and, and de Gaulle. De Gaulle. Exactly. Both came back. Churchill unsuccessfully, but de Gaulle to an entire... I think it's, it's folly to make a prediction, but I also think that at this moment in Russia's history, leaders are far smaller than the forces that are driving But you them. see, don't forget, we've never seen a situation in, inside the Soviet Union where a leader disappears and then comes back. There are so that's, many things we haven't seen right. inside well, the Soviet but I mean, Union but they don't have a provision in these for, five you know, years. For, for retiring with grace. That, uh, and, 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 right. that's, and I think in this particular case, uh, Gorbachev is going to be blamed for bringing the country to the verge of the abyss, as Gorbachev himself, himself has said that. And I, I would say that it's just impossible for him to come back. Mm -hmm. I just cannot see. He just that. doesn't have the support mm -hmm. of the people, what's more, right yeah, now. Right. I'm going to miss Mikhail Gorbachev. I am too. I am too. <laughs> well, I'm surprised to hear you say that. Uh, you know, you have. Professor Goldman, over the years, predicted his demise. Right. I didn't right. see you on television. You didn't say it's, you know, looking at your watch. Well, I, I asked, testified in Congress in night, March 87 that it would be he'd be lucky if he were there four years after that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to miss him because I think we owe him a lot. But the point is that he did make some terrible mistakes and the consequence we, we now see. Will you allow one objection to something one of the two of you said? Very brief? Yes, briefly, please. We're talking about people. At the moment, for the most part, the people are silent. What's going on in this country is a war among elites, I mean, at the parliamentary, leadership, military level. The people haven't spoken. The danger is they'll speak with violence rather than with democracy. And, and that's we'll the real danger. We'll be back. On that ominous <laughs> note, we'll be back in a moment. Posner Donahue transcripts and three dollars.
$5. Check or money order to Burrell's, Post Office Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, 07039, or call 1-800-777-TEXT. With a br very brief time left, we'll go around the table. What's going to happen? Professor Cohn, what's your crystal ball show you about the whole region? Less and less democracy, more and more authoritarianism, growing pain on the part of ordinary people who are being deprived of the basic things they need, growing role of people who control weapons, and probably a lot of foolish policy on the part of the West. I, s I see in the next few weeks uh, hunger, I see coal. Uh, already half the airports are not working in the Soviet Union because the oil distribution system has been broken. Central heating is at risk in the Soviet Union. Uh, the question is, can they get through the winter without some kind of violent display, some kind of uprising? After that, maybe down the road, particularly if Yeltsin's reforms are introduced, society may actually be gone, become back together again. Uh, ten years down the road, I would see indeed some stronger union than we uh, are going to see through this situation, but it's going to be a t time of change. Uh, very great hardship right now. Hopefully aid from the West to get through this period and the Commonwealth being a very good way to move a union of uh, voluntarily uh, wanting to bind together people. It will the, uh, what, will, what will America's role be here? Do you, do you think we'll retreat? I think it's going to be, I, I don't think we're going to retreat, but I don't think that we're going to be as expansive as we were because in part of our, our expansiveness came because we were interested in putting the Soviet Union down. But I hope that we'll be forthcoming. The problem is we have to have our own domestic problems now to, to worry about. And where is George Bush when we need him? He's so worried about the domestic economy and the election, he can't pay attention to the outside world. And you would add one line to that? That the Baker-Bush new policy of helping them on the condition that they do it our way is a recipe for disaster. We thank uh, Professors <laughs> Cohn and Goldman for their visit with us on this poster in Donahue. And Vladimir and I wish you a good day. While in New York, Posner Donahue guests stay at the Drake. The Drake offers a convenient midtown location filled with old world charm and elegance. The Drake, the only Swiss hotel on Park Avenue. Independent states. Mr. Gorbachev bows to the inevitable and says he's satisfied the new Commonwealth <laughs> is constitutionally correct. And the senior police officer who led the inquiry into P.C. Blakelock's murder is to face charges. Good evening. President Gorbachev has dropped his public opposition to the formation of a new Commonwealth of Soviet states, accepting that the move is constitutionally correct. But he's put his resignation on hold at least until next week. He says he will remain in office for Monday's visit to Moscow by the U.S. Secretary of State James Baker. Mr. Gorbachev spoke twice today to the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, and they agreed that the country's armed forces, especially the nuclear elements, will remain unified, at least for the time being. The new Soviet Commonwealth, founded on Sunday by Russia, Yellow Russia and the Ukraine, is growing. The southern republics of Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan now want to sign up, though they'll spend a week debating the details. Georgia and Moldova are thought unlikely to join, and Azerbaijan's government says it's in no hurry to become part of the new Commonwealth. From Moscow, Ben Brown reports. Mikhail Gorbachev was still carrying out his presidential duties today despite the talk of his demise. He met American businessmen and looked jovial and relaxed. <laughs> Asked when he'll be resigning, his spokesman said it certainly wouldn't be before Monday when the president's due to see America's Secretary of State James Baker. Today the Kremlin also announced a dramatic change of heart by Mr. Gorbachev about the new Commonwealth. Apparently, the president no longer thinks it's unconstitutional. In fact, he thinks it's becoming broad and representative. Even for the inconsistent Mr. Gorbachev, that's an astonishing switch from only yesterday when he bitterly denounced the Slavic Accord. 
Support for the Commonwealth is growing apace. Today, the five Central Asian republics signed and sealed a statement which says they are ready to join. At first, they'd been hostile to the Commonwealth, not so much the idea of it, rather the fact that they were not consulted about last week's agreement. I hope this accord will stick, said Nusaltan Nazarbayev, the leader of Kazakhstan. And his was the key signature today. Kazakhstan is the only republic outside the three Slavic states with nuclear weapons. The Central Asian republics, with their impoverished economies, had little choice but to work within the Commonwealth. Decades of rule from the Kremlin have left them heavily dependent on their richer neighbors in the north. The recent resurgence of Islam here made many people fear these republics might form their own power block. But now they're coming into the Commonwealth. And once nine or ten republics do join, Mr. Gorbachev has said he'll go. Effectively, that moment has now arrived. As well as the three founders of the Commonwealth, two others, Moldova and Armenia, have promised their support. And today, the five Central Asian states have also said that they will join. That makes the ten that Mr. Gorbachev said would be the trigger for his departure. <laughs> Boris Yeltsin, who was planning strategy with Russian deputies today, now seems to be receiving a gradual handover of power from Mr. Gorbachev. They had two sets of talks today. Apparently, the future of the armed forces, and in particular of nuclear weapons here, were high on their agenda. President Gorbachev is particularly worried about what's going on in Ukraine. There, the Republic's leader, Leonid Kravchuk, has declared himself commander-in-chief of his Republic's armed forces. But in a phone conversation with Mr. Gorbachev today, he gave an assurance that does not include command over strategic nuclear weapons. Tonight, the Soviet Defense Minister, Yevgeny Shapashnikov, went on television to promise the West there is no danger. Both strategic and tactical nuclear weapons, he said, will remain under central control. He also ruled out another coup. I can declare with full authority, he said, that the military are peaceful and there cannot be a putsch without them. But as the Soviet state breaks up, the other great fear is of escalating ethnic unrest and social disintegration. In the Republic of Moldova, there may have been a foretaste of that today. Thirteen people are said to have been killed during gun battles in a region where Russian nationalists oppose the Moldovan government's drive for independence. The test will be whether the new Commonwealth calms such conflicts or simply makes them worse. Ben Brown, BBC News, Moscow. Despite President Gorbachev's assertion that he won't be resigning just yet, the people of the Soviet Union are anticipating his political demise. But they're uncertain about how smooth a transition their new political masters can achieve. This evening's Izvestia newspaper appeared to have already consigned President Gorbachev and the Soviet Union to oblivion. The front page led on the Central Asian Republic's decision to join the new Commonwealth and the American Secretary of State's analysis of the situation. One of his vestures' chief commentators says Mr. Gorbachev will go down in history as a man of contradictions. If everything goes ahead in the democratic direction he started, he'll be credited for it. History will forgive him for his weakness in running the country, but in the short term, there's not very much sympathy. People associate him with the drop in living standards. That view was borne out in the streets. I really appreciate all the things he done. He has done if we take gladness and so on. It's really great because now we're free people, normal. But well, as, as if we take economical situation, well, you can see everything is horrible. Mr. Gorbachev ruined our country, I think so. And all these problems now, it's his fault, I think. Some of Mr. Gorbachev's less inhibited critics, supporters of the unified Soviet Empire, have been openly celebrating his demise. Thousands of officials in the Soviet Foreign Ministry and other central departments now scheduled for abolition have little reason to feel any more charitable towards Mr. Gorbachev. But some, like the Foreign Ministry spokesman Vitaly Churkin, can at least joke about it. Well, we'll join the ranks of the unemployed, I guess. Others have been left with the feeling that the old system has been hastily destroyed before a new one has been devised. No one has thought through how the transfer of power from the Soviet Union to the Commonwealth of Independent States will work, but it can only be a matter of time before the red flag here is lowered and the Kremlin becomes a symbol of Russian, not Soviet, might. Angus Roxborough, BBC News, Moscow.
President Bush has said he will continue to back those in the Soviet Union who favor democracy and reform. He's declined to write off Mr. Gorbachev despite the Soviet leader's increasing isolation. President Bush planning an international coalition to mobilize and coordinate aid for the former Soviet Union is still reluctant to declare Mikhail Gorbachev politically finished. This is not a helpful time to uh, editorialize on, on personalities inside the Soviet Union. We're supporting those who are reform, we're supporting those who are, for, who are for democracy, whoever they are, wherever they are, in whatever republic they are, and in the center. Mr. Bush took a telephone call from the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, and was again reassured on the question of the safety of nuclear weapons. We got interest in the fundamental interest and responsibility to the whole world for the nuclear weapons question. We want to see that that is handled with all to the maximum amount of safety, and the assurances from the center and from the republic has been very good on that, incidentally. Secretary of State Baker leaves tomorrow for the four key republics that have nuclear weapons on their soil, and he denied the Bush administration was backpedaling on recognizing the political reality of the new Commonwealth. If you notice, I am going to, the, to those republics uh, that were uh, the first to subscribe to the Commonwealth, and we are not reluctant to see it uh, for what it is as a very, very important event, but it is still in train. The process is still ongoing, and therefore we should not do anything that would be perceived as injecting ourselves into an internal political debate. As Washington settles down to celebrate Christmas, the Bush administration has been criticized in Congress for not doing enough quickly enough in aid. But next week, the first U.S. food shipments will leave for cities in the former Soviet Union, tidings of comfort, if not much joy. Gavin Esler, BBC News, Washington. The Trade and Industry Secretary, Peter Lilly, has urged British firms to boost their trade links with the Soviet Union. Speaking in the Commons, he said Western firms had to help restore the Soviet economy from the devastation wrought by socialism. Business has been anything but booming for Soviet firms touting for trade at this London exhibition. Out of 4,000 British companies which expressed an interest in the event, only a fraction have actually turned up. And when it comes to real investment, the republics are finding big business reluctant to take the plunge. Big projects like, uh, you know, that BP and uh, uh, British Gas and, uh, and other, uh, which is need a very huge investment, they of course very, uh, you know, that careful. Mrs. Thatcher led the way last year at the British Trade Fair in Kiev, but British business has yet to follow. In 1989, the Soviet Union imported £680 million pounds worth of goods from the United Kingdom, down to £600 million in 1990. But this year, it's estimated that figure will have been halved. It's not just because we can't or won't sell, but because they can't afford to buy. Now, more than ever, the government wants British companies to set up shop over there. The most painful part of the economic legacy of, uh, of socialism and communist control is the fearful cost of transition back from socialism to a market economy. And bold steps are needed to achieve that. But the Soviet Union, for want of a newer name, is the last place to look for a quick profit. Political turmoil and ethnic unrest, coupled with an unconvertible currency and rampant inflation, add up to a high risk by anyone's standards. One has to be very careful, and particularly in terms of selling to the Soviet Union, you want to make sure you're properly secured by letters of credit or other certain means of getting paid. Doing business in the Soviet Union is indeed a gamble, but one which could pay massive dividends. And the competition, Germany, Japan and France, is already ahead of Britain and playing for high stakes. The police officer who led the investigation into the murder of PC Keith Blakelock after the Broadwater Farm riots in 1985 is to be charged with perjury and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. The decision to charge Detective Chief Superintendent Graham Melvin comes a week after the men who were jailed for the murder had their convictions quashed by the Court of Appeal. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Neil Bennett, reports. Graham Melvin, with more than 30 years' service, is one of Scotland Yard's most senior detectives. He's been suspended since September, when the Tottenham 3 case was referred back to the Court of Appeal. 
His experience in investigating serious crime led to his taking charge of the biggest criminal inquiry ever carried out by the Metropolitan Police to find the killers of PC Blakelock. Mr Melvin conducted the vital interview with Winston Silcott, which proved to be the only evidence against him. It was enough to find him guilty of murder, but the appeal court quashed the conviction last month when the judges were told that scientific analysis of the interview notes by the ESDA test indicated they'd been altered. Former Detective Inspector Maxwell Dingle assisted with the interview, and he also faces a charge of conspiring to pervert the course of justice. Although Winston Silcott is still serving a life sentence for another murder, Engin Rakip and Mark Braithwaite were freed, and amid the chaos and confusion at the Court of Appeal, their supporters immediately threatened to bring a private prosecution against the police officers in the case unless the Crown took action against them. Mr Melvin was not called to give evidence during the appeal, but has said he will strongly contest all the allegations against him. Summonses were issued today by Bow Street Magistrates Court in London, where the two men are due to appear at the end of next month. The annual rate of inflation has risen for the first time in 14 months. In the year to November, prices rose by 4.3% compared with a 3.7% increase in the year to October. The Prime Minister said the figures were as expected and repeated his assertion that inflation has been licked. On the foreign exchanges, the pound made gains against the German mark after the Chancellor again ruled out a devaluation. Sterling closed at 2 marks 87.74, up almost two fennigs on the day. While Christmas shoppers still seem to be staying at home in droves, the Treasury had a busy day today explaining why nothing was what it seemed and that government policy hasn't changed. First, the 0.6% jump in the headline inflation rate and the slight rise in the underlying rate only meant that a year ago, mortgage rates and oil prices came down. We need to consider where we are now and where we were 12 months ago. We had inflation uh, rising to 11% and apparently going up very rapidly. It is now down to around 4%. It will stabilize at 4% and will then begin to drop again. And that is a better situation than we've had for many years, but not yet good enough. Opposition parties were unconvinced. Well, we already have uh, rising bankruptcies, unemployment, home repossessions, and now we have inflation rising too, although the Prime Minister did tell us not long ago that the government had it licked. This isn't a minor blip, it's an illustration of the long-term United Kingdom trend for inflation. It's something that governments are there to stop. Headline inflation peaked a year ago at nearly 11%, plunged to October's 3.7%, before edging back to today's 4.3% for November. It's now expected to drift below 4% by the end of next year. Underlying inflation, which excludes mortgage interest payments, also peaked last autumn at 9.5%, fell more slowly to October's 5.5%, and now is a notch up at 5.7%. It's expected to fall further and to converge towards the headline rate by the end of next year. Inflation in the other exchange rate mechanism countries has remained and is expected to remain close to 4% throughout the period. The author of the day's other red herring was the Chancellor himself. The pound rose one and a half pennies on a chance remark by Mr Lamont to foreign journalists that Britain would one day move from the present broad bands under the exchange rate mechanism to narrow bands still centred on two Deutschmark 95 to the pound as at present. But the Treasury later explained that the Chancellor was only repeating precisely what he told the House of Commons a year ago yesterday. There was no change in government policy. The Chief Constable of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, Hugh Annesley, has described last night's bomb attack in County Armagh as an indescribable evil. The 2,000 pound bomb, one of the biggest ever used in the province, went off without warning in Craig Avon, injuring 70 people, destroying the police station and extensively damaging the school and the Roman Catholic Church. The police station at Brownlow was destroyed by the huge explosion. More than 70 people were injured, most of them only slightly. But the remark common to security forces and politicians alike was that it was a miracle no one was killed. The 2,000-pound bomb blew out a crater 40 feet across and 12 feet deep, and it exploded without warning. There was extensive damage to other buildings across a wide area. The local Catholic primary school was devastated. Santa Claus was to come to our nursery on Monday morning next three or four-year-old children. 
we're very much looking forward to his coming. And this is the Christmas box this year. A nearby Catholic church was also damaged. There was a carol service going on in there when the bomb went off. One 16-year-old girl who was in the congregation had her arm injured. The window at the back just went flying in and all the windows went in and just everybody was squealing and all of her was stay down, stay down and everything was falling and, and it's just everybody was panicking. Houses close by and others up to half a mile away were damaged. The Northern Ireland Security Minister and the RUC Chief Constable visited the scene today. Take a good look. This is the latest Christmas message from the IRA. We want to make the children suffer. We want to make the sick suffer. We want to make the church suffer. We want to put people out of jobs. Happy Christmas from the IRA. This is a democracy. It's not a totalitarian regime. You do not have a curfew. And as long as that prevails, you can never say with certainty that a bomb cannot be placed, particularly a bomb with no warning. And, and don't let us forget, there was no warning. The chairman of the Northern Ireland Police Authority has said they will not be dictated to by the bomb and the bullet, and there will be a new Brownlow police station. The Spanish authorities have closed the case on Robert Maxwell's death. The final forensic report says he probably died of a heart attack. In London, his son Kevin Maxwell has told the High Court that he is willing to spend every waking hour helping to trace the millions of pounds missing from the Mirror Group pension funds. Kevin Maxwell emerged from the High Court this evening, reluctant to say anything as his legal anxieties multiplied. No, 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 the court heard how only four and a half files out of a total of 40 are ready to be handed over to the liquidator. The judge granted Mr. Maxwell an extension until Monday for that to happen. Mr. Maxwell's lawyers agreed that he would meet the liquidator on Wednesday, but they said he wouldn't necessarily answer all questions in case his answers would prejudice his defence if criminal charges should arise. There are now four serious fraud office inquiries underway or under consideration. The latest concerns the roller coaster career of Maxwell Communication shares. They started the year at £1.50, but in March they rose 40 pence, due in part, it was thought, to buying by Goldman Sachs, the American investment bank, and there's no suggestion it broke the rules. And in April, the price rocketed to nearly £2.40. Apparently on the news, former Cabinet Minister Peter Walker had agreed to become chairman. They fell back during the summer when he changed his mind and collapsed catastrophically at the time of Robert Maxwell's death. An SFO inquiry would focus on illegal attempts to boost the share price in April and prop it up in July. In August 1990, Robert Maxwell sold Goldman Sachs an option to sell him shares at a price well above what they were in the market, at a sensitive time for the company. The deal was legal, but it had the effect of boosting the share price. I think the rules should be changed so that inside interests are not allowed to use option transactions to encourage others to purchase shares effectively on their behalf during the period up to the general meeting when they would not be allowed to do it themselves. The other Robert Maxwell investigation into how he died on his yacht closed today. The verdict, he probably died of a heart attack, but drowning might also have been a factor. Insurers faced with a £20 million payout said they weren't satisfied. The United Nations Secretary General says he's prepared to send observers to Yugoslavia to show the peace process is still alive. The move is being seen as an attempt to head off a proposal by Germany to officially recognize the breakaway republics of Croatia and Slovenia. The Secretary General has warned that to do so could fuel an already explosive situation. Despite this, Germany said tonight it still intends to recognize the two republics before the end of the year. Three weeks after the 14th ceasefire agreed by all parties, Croatian fighters are maintaining their onslaught against the federal mortar rounds. This is Pakrak in central Croatia and one of the many battles for strategic villages and valleys. Each side claims the other opened fire first. In the words of the United Nations Secretary General, the conditions for establishing a peacekeeping operation in Yugoslavia still do not exist. 
But tonight, further moves are underway to try to keep the UN peace process alive. The Security Council is meeting in closed session to discuss sending some form of advance party to Yugoslavia. France, supported by Britain, has proposed 100 military observers should go immediately to dissuade Germany from recognizing Croatia and Slovenia as independent states. The Secretary General, Mr. Perez de Cuella, has written to the Chairman of the European Community Foreign Ministers, who are due to meet on Monday, warning them against uncoordinated actions. I am deeply worried that any early selective recognition could widen the present conflict, he said, and fuel an explosive situation, especially in Bosnia-Herzegovina and Macedonia. Indeed, serious consequences could ensue for the entire Balkan region. That view has been echoed by the European Community Monitors, but Germany says it still intends to recognize Croatia and Slovenia before the end of the year, and the warnings have not changed the government's position. The Prime Minister has rejected Labour's claims that he misled the public over the true nature of the Maastricht Treaty's social chapter, which Britain alone among its EC partners refused to sign at the Maastricht summit. Labour say the European Employers' Federation backs their view that British laws relating to strikes and unions would not be repealed by signing up. But tonight, Mr Major insisted he had been misquoted and had never uttered the word repeal once. The Prime Minister, today visiting a pathology lab in North London, said in a letter to Labour's Tony Blair that the point he's been making about the social chapter was that it would have guaranteed a permanent and overweening power for trade unions in shaping the country's future. But Labour claimed he's implied that the chapter would have meant changes to the government's trade union legislation, and that was not the case. It isn't just misleading, it's untrue. Today, the European Employers' Organization has issued a statement saying that the social chapter is not connected in any way, I quote them, with strikes or with unions. And consequently, the Prime Minister must have known that. And so he was consciously giving an entirely false impression, both to the House of Commons and to the British people. Comments from the Employment Secretary Michael Howard on Channel 4's Parliament programme were also seized on by Labour. He said the social chapter would not have forced the government to repeal its trade union laws, but he added that it would have wrecked the effect of those laws. A former cabinet minister says the government fears were justified. Well, that does depend entirely on the content uh, which is put into the legislation which the social chapter permits. But plainly, it aroused the anxieties that it could be used in that way. And you couldn't possibly say that those were unreal fears. In next week's Commons debate on Maastricht, Labour will challenge Mr Major directly over their claim that he's been dishonest in his portrayal of the social chapter. But ministers say they welcome Labour's attacks as they remind voters of their trade union laws, which they consider to be one of the more popular reforms of the Thatcher years. Dr Jim Swire, whose daughter died in the Lockerbie bombing, has been criticised in America for meeting the Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi. Campaigners in America say the trip discredited efforts to bring those responsible to justice. But Dr. Swire says he talked to Colonel Gaddafi as one bereaved father to another. The Colonel's adopted baby daughter died in the 1986 American bombing of Tripoli. Dr. Swire spent six days in Libya and had not made the visit public before his departure. Andrew Castle reports. Jim Swire says his appointment with Colonel Gaddafi was a personal one without political motive, a face-to-face -face meeting between bereaved fathers. There was a certain amount of discussion of how the Lockerbie disaster might have been caused, but the main content was uh, concerning the deaths of our daughters, and I tried to keep it at a personal level because that's what I felt I'd come about. I also made the point that the relatives in Britain uh, want the trial held in Scotland. A point he reiterated to the judge in charge of the Libyan inquiry into the bombing. He, however, firmly ruled out extradition. Sorry, we cannot. So, for the time being, the two suspects, Abdel Mohamed Al Magri and Al Amin Khalifa Fahma, will remain in Tripoli. A spokesman for some of the American relatives of those killed when Pan Am 103 was blown up condemned Dr. Swire's Libyan trip. Bert Ammerman, who lost a brother, says there should be no contact until the Libyans are handed over. We know that Dr. Swire was well-intentioned in his, in his efforts. It was from his heart. Sadly, he left his brain back home. Uh, he's being manipulated by the Libyan government. He's being so naive. We've worked for three years to get it out of the criminal arena and into the political arena. A citizen should not be going over and interfering on governmental matters. What Dr. Swire has done is inexcusable. 
The Lord Advocate, who would prosecute the case in Britain, believes Dr. Swire's visit hasn't changed the legal position. Nothing less than the handing over of the two Libyans would satisfy his efforts to pursue justice in the aftermath of Britain's worst terrorist atrocity. Tonight's main news again. President Gorbachev has dropped his public opposition to the formation of a new Commonwealth of Soviet states, but he says he has no intention of stepping down in the next few days. There will be more on Newsnight on BBC Two at half past ten as usual, but that's the nine o'clock news tonight. Good night. The blast left a crater 13 metres across and 4 metres deep. Of the 70 people injured, most suffered slight cuts and shock. The most common remark today was it was a miracle no one was killed. Take a good look. This is the latest Christmas message from the IRA. Nearby buildings were extensively damaged. The local primary school was wrecked. Santa Claus was to come to our nursery on Monday morning next. The three or four year old children were very much looking forward to his coming and this is the christmas box this year at the local catholic church parishioners had been attending a carol service when the explosion happened the window with the baptist went flying in and all the windows went in and just everybody was squealing and all of her was stay down stay down houses up to half a kilometer away felt the blast in one home a christmas cake was sliced by flying glass we're just thankful that we're not preparing today for funerals the authorities have vowed to rebuild the police station in defiance of the terrorist attack. In London, Steve Kerry, 7 Nightly News. In London, Steve Kerry, 3 National News. Tell me most of the time, it was a high-risk, high-wire act without a net. It was like hang-gliding over dangerous territory. Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev set out not only to reform the Soviet Union, but also to revive socialism, to give communism a human face, to save it by transforming it. He failed. Instead, he buried Lenin's legacy and he changed the world. He was a product of the party he later destroyed. Born on the 2nd of March, 1931, in the tiny village of Privolnoy in the northern Caucasus, Merino sheep country, home to the largest flock of Merinos outside Australia. The young Mikhail Gorbachev worked here as a combine driver on his father's collective farm. He went to Moscow State University, where he joined the Communist Party and graduated in law. His party career was meteoric. First secretary in Stavropol in 1960, Ten years later, a member of the party's policy-making Central Committee. In 1978, Leonid Brezhnev promoted him to the Politburo and put him in charge of agriculture. Within hours of Konstantin Chernenko's death in March 1985, Gorbachev is elected General Secretary. He's only 54. He first came... This is the primary audio circuit from Viz News London. This is the primary audio circuit from Viz News London.